I'm excited about today's message. We are wrapping up the book of Exodus on what has been a journey, and that's actually the title of the series is The Journey, because the book of Exodus uh, really, really is pretty cool because I think it's so fitting for the journey that all of us are on. And it's primarily about the life of Moses and the nation of Israel as they're delivered from bondage. And it, it starts with Moses and the call that's on his life. And for us, that's a reminder that all of us are called. All of us are called. And, and like here's like the major themes of Exodus and the journey that we're all on, that we have to embrace the call of God on our life. Then the next thing is that though we may have doubts and fears and insecurities, we have to overcome them and trust God if we're ever going to be what he's called us to be. And God is so much more concerned about who you are than what you do. Because the reality is that everything that you do flows from who you are. So if you embrace the call that he has on your life, if you overcome those fears and doubts and insecurities, and you begin, and here's the third thing, to step out. Step out in faith. Listen to me. God will meet you. Uh, we saw, I think, two messages ago that was like God moments. Like when you step out, that's when the miraculous takes place. You know, that so many people, they want like this miraculous sign or they want the miracles so that they can step out. But you realize that's not faith. And God's called us on this faith journey to embrace the call, to, to trust that, that we are what he's created us to be and that we can do what he's called us to do. And when we step out because we believe him, we step out in faith, then the miraculous happens. As we saw last week in, in Exodus 32, even the best of, of times and the best of people mess up. And so we'll have to deal with on the journey of life, even though we've embraced the call and, and we're, we're walking in confidence, um, we've stepped out. Sometimes there's things that just, we derail ourselves. There's failure and we have to fight through that failure. And if you do that, then we come to the very end of the book of Exodus. And it, it really is about making a place for the presence of God. You see, the book of Exodus, you know, I was always taught, and it's true, that it's about the place, t God taking a people who were in bondage and bringing them to a place of promise. And that's so true. It's so true. And, and let me tell you, it's just interesting to me that the book of Exodus is about a group of slaves that God sets free. And we're talking about it today. How cool is that? And I've just been taught, yeah, it's God has a, a place of promise for us and he so does. But actually, if we look at the book of Exodus and the end of it, it's really, you get to the place of promise and the nation of Israel got to the place of promise. They didn't get there in the book of Exodus, but you can read on. And, and if you're reading the McShane Bible reading plan through the year, you, you are reading on, you realize that they ultimately do get there but the book of Exodus ends when they're making a place for the presence of God. You know, we actually saw that in, in chapters 33 when, when Moses would go to the tent of meeting and he's personally meeting with God. And, and, and for each of us, like we, we have to recognize that we are called to personally be in the presence of God personally. But there's something that happens when we come together and we say, we, us, you watching, me here, the, the church, the people that are, that are live, like the body of Christ, Christians that say, this is us, we are gonna make a place for the presence of God. It's so powerful. And, and the, the book ends with them actually making a physical place, the tabernacle and, and the presence of God filling it. And, and we'll talk about that. But I, I want us to, to see what it takes to get to the place where that presence of God is filling whatever space we've set up. So just a brief recap. I know you're thinking, dear Lord, you just recap the whole book. Um, and chapter 32 is failure. In chapter 33, God speaks to them after the failure and says, keep going. And then Moses begins to meet with God at this tent of meeting, and it begins to change everything. He has God encounters. And then uh, God speaks to him and calls him back up to the mountain and gives him another set of tablets. And Moses' sin was that um, he threw down the very thing that God had given him. So often we do that. And he made right, though, what was wrong. He made right what was wrong. 
And then we see Moses is back up on the mountain hearing from God, and God gives him some instructions for the whole nation. It's interesting that Moses' personal time in the tent of meeting ultimately spilled over with a message from God for the people around him. That's applicable to you and to me. So, after failure, but they're gonna keep going, Moses is meeting with God up on the mountain. God gives him some instructions about making a place for his presence, making this tabernacle, this place where he says that his presence will dwell. But as I read through this, I, I realized, though I've read this many times, that 35, chapter 35, seems a little out of place, but I think it's perfectly fitting for us today, and God knew what he was doing and putting it right here. So after the failure and Moses is with God, we see chapter 35, God speaking to him and says, speak this to the nation. So here it is. I'm going to read the first few verses of chapter 35 in the book of Exodus. Then Moses called together the whole community of Israel and told them, these are the instructions the Lord has commanded you to follow. Pause. God's giving the whole nation instructions to follow after their failure. And if I hear that, like I know what it was like when I got in trouble at school or I got in trouble at home and like, I'm gonna have to talk to you now. I'm, I'm dreading that. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is it? And I know that the consequences are gonna be terrible. This is what he says though. Here's the instructions the Lord's commanded you to follow. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on that day must be put to death. You must not even light a fire in any of your homes on the Sabbath. So, so wait a minute. After this big mess up and then God saying, you've got another chance and I'm going to bring you to the place of promise and I'm going to make a place for my presence, it begins with him telling them, hey, you need to keep the Sabbath. Wait, what? And like, it's serious. It's for real. Like, anyone who works on that day must be put to death. Like, like wait, seriously, God? That's huge. And like, why is that? Why is that? Because God's called us to make a place for him from a place of rest in our lives. Making a place from God for God in our lives comes from a place of rest. It doesn't come from a place of chaos, craziness, commandments, being forced. God's saying, I want you to take a rest. I want you to think about this. Like, why would he do that? Why would he say after their failures and then reasserting his, his commitment to them and this promise that I've got this place for you, his very next thing is, you need to take a rest. <clears throat> well, let's, let's read on. I'm going to answer two things at once because he doesn't just stop with the rest. He says, okay, you got to keep the Sabbath. And then verse four, he says, then Moses said to the whole community of Israel, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. Then the next many verses are the things that, that they're to bring to the presence of the Lord. They're to give it gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread, a bunch of things. And then in verse 20, it says, so the whole community of Israel left Moses and returned to their tents. And all whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of its rituals, for the sacred garments. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing. They brought to the Lord their offerings of gold, and then it goes through everything they brought. And then verse 29, it says, so the people of Israel, every man and woman who was eager to help in the work of the Lord, had given them through Moses, brought their gifts, and they gave them freely to the Lord. The two ingredients that, that I see here, and it's really pretty simple, that if we're going to make a place for God, it's because we have faith in him. These two ingredients, take a day, give it to him. 
rest. Sacrifice, give, give offerings. He's calling for offerings. It doesn't say that actually all of them did this, though I bet the first one they probably did. Y'all heard the consequence. But it said, those whose hearts were willing. And that's really what God wants for, from us, to trust him, to have faith in him. Trust him with what? Our time. Do you trust God with your time? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I'll work for hard for him and I know that he's gonna, okay. Do you work too hard? Do you work as if everything depended on you? Guilty. I've been very guilty of that in the past. Very guilty of that. Like, yeah, God's gonna do it, but I can't sit on my behind, so let's work. I mean, even as a pastor, there were times that I remember like, man, when have I taken a day off? I remember this, it, it, was, it was over a month that I realized I really hadn't taken a day off at all. That's, that's actually a statement that my faith is in me. How convicting. Do I have faith to honor God with my time by trusting him and resting? Look, I know it's been a crazy season. If you're not, if you're listening to me, and I know we have a lot of people all over that watch, but if, if you're not in Louisiana, if you, well, let me restate that. If you're in Lake Charles, you've probably been working too much because it's crazy. But at what point are we gonna trust God and say, Lord, I'm gonna give you that day off and I'm gonna rest and I'm gonna seek you. By the way, just a reminder, it's one of the 10 commandments. One of the 10 commandments, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That means keep it, it's set apart for God, set apart for rest. And listen, I'm not gonna get all crazy about like, what, what day is it? Like, do you, like, what did Jesus say about it? I'm, you need to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy and set apart. And I, maybe I'll end the argument or maybe just start it with Romans 14 where Paul writes and he says, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that what, whichever day you choose is acceptable. Let's start with honoring God and his word and trusting him. Okay, I've been working too much. Lord, I'm giving you this day. This day is yours, I will rest. That is a statement of faith. It's not our actions that make us right with God. It's our ability to trust him. And out of that flows his righteousness into us and then through us. So when you give him your time, you're saying, Lord, I trust that this day that I'm not doing anything, you're going to catch me on the backside and help me out. Put him to the test. He will. He will. I know because I've done that. And it's been life-giving for me. It's been life-giving for the people around me. And I've watched God show up and show off. This is a faith issue. How do we make a place for God? We make it first from a place of rest. Like, you're not going to be able to build something with your hands or with your idea that, that he's going to go, wow, I never thought of that. He wants you to trust him. How are you going to get to the place where you can dream if you can barely stay awake because you're working yourself to the bone? Trust him. I hope this is encouraging to you that it's okay to stop. In fact, it's more than just okay to slow down and rest. It's mandated by God. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And unfortunately, and I get it. Listen, I've probably done it myself. Sometimes there's a little bravado, maybe a little bragging with, oh yeah, well, I've been working. I've been working for, and name the hours, name the days, name the weeks. But the Ten Commandments, one of them says, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, set apart, let it be a day of rest. Then it goes into the offerings, because we're not just called to trust God and have faith with our time. We're also to have faith in our finances, to trust him with our treasure, but from a place of willingness, because we believe, because we trust God. So many people have issues with, with being generous, 
or being obedient and just giving to God. Like Malachi 3.10, you hear pastors quoted all the time. Gosh, I used to hate this. And as a pastor, I used to really be uncomfortable discussing money, but I've learned this. That if I trust God with my finances and I trust him that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my 10% plus I'm going to give more, like why do I do that? I don't do that because a pastor told me to do that and you shouldn't either. I don't do that because I feel like somebody's strong arming me into that. Don't let anybody strong arm you into that. But God says this in Malachi 3, he says, hey, uh, you're robbing me. You're robbing me, and they respond like, robbing, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Okay, let's analyze that for just a moment. Does God need your money? What are you robbing him of? It's not the money. You're robbing him of the opportunity to step up and show you that you can trust him. You wanna make a place for God in your life? Trust him with your time. Trust him with your finances. Listen, I'm not going to go, oh, well, yeah, I see that you're not giving here. And like, oh, you and pick up the phone. You need to, that. That's ridiculous. Because even in the New Testament, it says God loves a cheerful giver. All those whose hearts were willing. Not compulsory. You want to make a place for God, though? Trust him with your time. Trust him with your treasure. Verse 30, trust him with your talent. Moses requotes basically chapter 31, and it says, Moses told the people, the Lord has specifically chosen, chosen Bezalel, the son of Uri, grandson of Ur, the tribe of Judah. The Lord has filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God. This is the first time we see someone filled with the Holy Spirit. He's giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of craft. He's a master craftsman, expert in working in gold, silver, and bronze. He's skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and carving wood. He's a master at every craft. And the Lord has given both him and Oholiab, the son of, some guy I can't pronounce, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach their skills to others. The Lord has given them special skills and it goes on to say what they are. You are a gifted and called person. You're a gifted and called person. And I want you to know that when you trust God with your time, when you trust him with your treasure, and when you trust him with your talents, and you say, Lord, here they are, but they're not just for me. And you use your time wisely according to his word. And that day that you take off, you go, thank you, Lord, and you unwind. You begin to be grateful, like verbalize what he's done for the, you that you're grateful for. When you're able to freely and willingly with a right heart, give because you trust God. But reminder, both of those are, are, are things that we're called to do as believers but we're also called to give him the gifts that he's given us and how he's wired us and say, Lord, I'm going to use it to make the world around me a beautiful place. Cool stuff happens. And if you look at chapters 36, 37, 38, it's all about the preparation and all about these guys that are building. The people have brought their gifts, their gold and their threads and everything to make the place. They brought their physical resources to make the place of this tabernacle, this glorified tent, really beautiful. And this is what happens is in the end is they've, they've rested. They've given God their time. They've given him their treasure and they're letting him use their talents. They're using their talents for him. In chapter 40, we see the first verse says, The Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. Place the Ark of the Covenant inside. Install the inner curtains. And he goes on with more, more requirements of, of this tabernacle. After they do everything, they make this place beautiful. It says this in verse 34. It says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Like God's presence was there. Like it was so powerful that there was this cloud 
The cloud covered the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord. Like, what is that? God showing up in such a big way that it makes a huge impact that everybody can see. And you would think that'd be a great drawing point, but here's what was interesting to me. It says Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud didn't rise, they remained where the Lord, uh, where they were until it lifted. And the cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the, the day. And at night, the fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journey. Their faith in honoring God with the Sabbath. Their faith in honoring him with their finances. Their faith in saying, these hands, this heart, God, they're yours. It's what kept them on the journey because they made a place for the presence of God. Because at the end of the day, that journey wasn't just for them, it was for us. And as you embrace God's purpose and plan for your life and you step out in faith, you say, Lord, I'm answering the call. I'm going to overcome those insecurities and fear. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to give you my time. I'm going to give you all of me. I'm going to honor you with my finances. I'm going to get, take the gifts that you've given me and give them back to you to make the place for you beautiful. And it ends up being the place of promise for the generations to come, as well as for the people around you right now. And that's what God's called us to. Let's keep going on the journey. Follow the presence of the Lord in your life, but you won't have it if you don't trust him, answer the call, and step out in faith. Listen, God's at work in you. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. It's great being with you. Love you guys. Have a great Sunday.